the commander of the 5th Corps of the Army, which includes the 101st as well as the 3rd Infantry Division, has been making a swing through the area, rallying the troops. It wasn't good enough just to stand down at the bottom. He wanted to climb on top of the bunker. So he climbs up on top of the bunker to address the crowd, gives this rousing speech. Because I had to believe that we're on short final for rendezvous with destiny. The president's going to talk to the nation tonight. He's going to talk to you and me tonight. But I think what he's probably going to tell you and me is the following. He's going to tell us that all the waiting is over. The message the troops was unmistakably clear. Get ready. The pace of the war preparations here at Camp New York for the 101st Airborne has quickened noticeably. And it really let the troops know that, okay, this is real, this is going to happen, and, and uh, we're ready to go. The full moon lit up the desert night, possibly the last night of peace before war, and everyone out here knows it. This is perhaps the last night of letters home or small talk for a long time. This last night of peace offered a friendly moon. The equipment works better when it's not absolutely dark. But in the darkened theater of war, there are rules. No cigarettes, no flashlights, no white light of any kind. To be visible is to be in danger. As the troops sleep and work and stand guard and the world waits, the last night of peace gives way to the long night of war. I heard that the war had started uh, through one of the uh, one of the intelligence officers mentioned, just kind of dropped a hint that game is on. I went into the Tactical Operations Center and I see these red arrows sweeping up into Iraq labeled Third ID. And I remember the feeling around the camp was, okay, let's go. All right, Third ID's in, we're gonna go, we're gonna go. Um, didn't happen that way. The men of the 101st got there, but their equipment was way behind them and has not been there quite in time to be fully prepared, and it's one of the reasons they, at this point, have not moved forward. Things changed daily, sometimes numerous times each day the, the battle plans changed. One day we heard that we were going to be leaving within a day. The 101st right now is getting ready and getting poised to take some action. That's about all I can tell you according to the ground rules that we are embedded under. And then it would get stretched out for a week. 101st Airborne and their equipment are still trying actually to meet and be completely integrated with one another before they can leave Kuwait and join the battle. It was a roller coaster ride and I think everybody's hopes would kind of soar and then, and then fall a little bit knowing at one moment we really were going to be uh, tip of the spear, and the next we looked like we were not the main effort. Most of the guys were working their butts off to get the equipment ready. Once it arrived, it arrived so late and there was so much to be done on it. But there's a certain degrading of abilities when you are waiting and waiting and waiting in one place. The anticipation starts to drag on. And as we watched Third ID and the Marines, just tearing up territory, just moving so fast. There became, as the hours and then days went by, there became this real concern, is there gonna be anything left for the 101st to do? Uh, after all this training, after being out there um, for almost a month in, the, in Camp New York, you know, is, is this gonna be worthwhile? Hey, where are they going? They need to go that way. The day that we actually went across the border. We were told that we were leaving in 11 hours. There was incredible energy in the camp. Hey, listen up, gentlemen. All of a sudden, everything became no, just frenetic. Go back to your vehicles. Get Trucks your were being road. loaded. The soldiers were being issued ammunition. It was intense. Spread these maps out. Make sure the rear vehicle gets one. We're going to depart the spot on Route 8. We went in vehicles, in trucks and Humvees, went across the line. It was one of the most incredible movements of an army that I have certainly ever seen, and perhaps history has ever seen, because they rode straight for 33 hours. The mad dash from hell, we drove in total blackout, which is it's thrilling and terrifying and a little bit crazy. <laughs> because you have a long line of vehicles kicking up this talcum powder dust and no headlights. 
so they're trying to go 40 miles an hour or whatever. It, it seemed like lunacy, and there were a number of vehicles who ran off the road. Ours ran off the road, the vehicle I was in one time. Um, specialist Brandon Berry was, was driving. I felt so bad for him. It's the things like that about warfare and the dangers of warfare that you never think about. We finally reached Najaf early, early in the morning. It was still dark, and there had been obvious signs of fighting when we started rolling into town. We pulled up to a bridge, and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Brooke gathered together his officers, and they set about planning their force protection, the defensive emplacements that they have to keep any enemy from hurting them while they were getting established there. They had a map spread out on a Humvee, and they had little red pin lights, which is the only light they were allowing themselves to use, setting up where they were going to put their, their positions. They had no idea what to expect. It was a very, very tense night until morning break. After an arduous 32-hour hellbent for leather dash across southern Iraq, 101st is now linked up with the 3rd Infantry Division surrounding the city of An Najaf. Now their task is to reinforce the 3rd ID, specifically at passage points into and out of the city. There were a few occasions when uh, cars would run off of the road, but there were no injuries, and as you can see, they made it here and are now ready to go into action for the first time for the 101st in this war. What they did not expect that we witnessed was the reception. For these guys to wade into this town in the middle of Iraq and have the crowds first very slowly, kind of curious and a little bit scared, but then more and more, 20 and then it was 100 and then it was 200, cheering and singing and bush, bush, good, good. The Iraqis were friendly, they were cheering. Um, we drove by them and they were waving at us. It was everything these soldiers had hoped they would see. For perhaps the first time this war, Iraqis happily welcomed the invading forces. You are all these people who are friends, well, not enemies. So Saddam is an enemy for you and for me. It was, for the soldiers, a brief reward for a day full of accomplishments. Don Daler, ABC News, Najaf, Iraq. as the 3rd Infantry Division did their blitz to Baghdad, we would be in their wake. And so, essentially, we went from town to town in that vacuum, in that void that they had created as they blitzed through, essentially calling out for any fighters that might still be around looking for trouble. Bravo Company went on what they describe as a search and attack mission. Their target, paramilitary units that fired on a scouting operation earlier today. As a PSYOPs truck blared messages in Arabic warning civilians to stay in their homes, they searched abandoned office building looking for enemy units as well as caches of arms and ammunition. It is a violent, noisy, destructive process. Tell them the first floor is secure on the, on the north side of the building. I don't know how many hundreds of patrols I went on where these guys were having to kick down doors and climb walls with a high degree of tension because you didn't know who was going to take a pot shot at you. And the pot shots did happen. It was exhausting, exhausting work for these soldiers. There's a lot of climbing and running and breaking down and doors. Right there, just... uh, it is not the kind of thing that, uh, that these soldiers were hoping to do, but it is, in some ways, they believe, a taste of what may lie ahead as we move into more and more urban parts of Iraq. We had these little narrow alleys with the, the mud walls on either side, and there's no telling what's going to be waiting when you go around the next corner. There were times where a family would be home, and the soldiers would have to search the house. Now, the soldiers were trained to be respectful of the family and to request permission to search the house. They wouldn't just automatically go in 